This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. So thank you. Um, today I'm going to talk about brain injury rehabilitation. And the story of brain injury rehabilitation to me starts right here in Pensacola. Back in 1977, you probably saw Star Wars for the first time or bought your first Apple II computer. For me, um, the rehabilitation hospital, um, let's see, West Florida Rehabilitation, West Florida Institute of Rehabilitation, I believe, I'm sorry, um, opened, opened its doors. My mom decided to be a dietitian there. My swim coach decided to be a recreational therapist there. And all of our family friends were getting jobs there. So I decided to volunteer there. And it was really life-changing, uh, getting to see the different outcomes and what people were experiencing there. I wanted to be a part of that. So I wanted to be a physician. And so the next thing I learned is during medical school, I learned that there's actually a specialty for people who want to work at rehabilitation hospitals. It's got a complicated name, as Kim pointed out. <laughs> it's, it's called physiatry, or our field also likes to pronounce it physiatry. Or if you can't say any of those, it's just called physical medicine and rehabilitation, which is what most of us do. Um, it's a really different field. We treat a lot of different um, organ systems instead of just one organ system. Uh, diseases and injuries that affect the muscles, bones, nerves, uh, tendons, ligaments. But what we do is we treat the whole person, and we try to determine how we can decrease disease burden, how we can improve function and improve quality of life. And to do that, we, we treat people with musculoskeletal injuries like back pain and sports injuries. We also treat people with neurologic diseases like spinal cord injury, brain injury, which is why we're here, uh, stroke, cancer to brain and spine, multiple sclerosis, and other diseases like that. So as I got further in my training, I decided I actually wanted to further specialize. So I wanted to specialize in brain injury rehabilitation. And there's a lot of reasons that I decided to do that. I found an incredible mentor who took me under her arm and decided that she wanted to show me the ways of brain injury. And she had my attention because the patients we were treating were just showing me these incredible outcomes. So I got to work with her as a medical student at the same place I later did my residency. And I took care of this gentleman, Chris, who he, severe brain injury, for weeks was unresponsive. He came to our rehabilitation unit, and he was still what we call minimally responsive. He wasn't responding very well, very often to, to commands. And I left that month of that rotation thinking that that was his outcome. I had no idea that he actually might be back at school or have a, a family relationship, other things. I didn't know what his difficulties would be or what they weren't going to be. And fortunately, two years later, I was doing my residency, and I walk into the clinic, and the nurse says, the next gentleman, Chris, um, he wants to talk to you about uh, the difficulties he's having in college. And I looked at his name, and I said, well, I actually know someone named Chris of the same name, and this can't possibly be the same person. And looked through the medical records, saw my handwriting. It's the exact same gentleman that I'd taken care of two years before. But this guy was in college, and he was having some relatively minor difficulties in, in college. And I just, man, I had to be a part of this. I was hooked. So brain injury. Unfortunately, brain injury can happen to anyone, anytime, and anywhere. It happens predominantly to males, although uh, in the elderly, we're seeing a lot of uh, brain injuries due to falls, and that's predominantly in women because the women are uh, living longer. Uh, the most common reason for brain injury is falls, and the most common, uh, next most common is uh, traffic accident, accidents and being hit in the head. Uh, either at work or other, other times, or, or assaults are also very common, unfortunately. And then we also are seeing a lot of anoxic brain injuries uh, from drug overdose and cardiac arrest. For the most part, I'll be talking about traumatic brain injury, but every once in a while I'll be talking about other types of brain injury. So how common is it? Pretty much everyone in this room probably knows somebody with a brain injury. A lot of people don't know they've had a brain injury, and so sometimes you, you may not have thought about the fact that they've had a brain injury, that you know someone with a brain injury, but it's very common, happening about every 15 seconds in the United States. So we've already had several brain injuries in the United States since we started this talk. So luckily, most people do fine. They get up, walk away, and may never have a problem. 
they had what we call a mild brain injury. But sometimes people have uh, long-term problems. Luckily, um, there are 80, 88% of the people who will have a brain injury in the United States uh, are thought to go to the emergency room and then go home. Only 11% are needing to be hospitalized. So you know, most of the people are getting, getting better and going home. And only 6% are going on to live with long-term disability from the brain injury. So um, to put that into perspective when you think about the outcomes of brain injury. So what's it like to live with a brain injury? So there are a lot of things you don't see in someone who's living with brain injury that they are dealing with every day. So there's a laundry list of symptoms. The symptoms are different for everyone depending on how the brain injury hit them and depending on different uh, factors uh, of that determine their outcome. But there are all sorts of symptoms, so dizziness and lightheadedness and fatigue, difficulty sleeping, difficulty concentrating, short-term memory difficulties, uh, difficulty with your balance, being irritable, aggressive. Sometimes people have difficulty with spasticity and motor control. Um, the list goes on. Not everyone has all of those things, although sometimes people can have a good number of the things on the list, which can make life quite difficult. But if you see them, you might not know. So what can we do? Luckily, we, there's a lot of things that we can do to help people with brain injury. And we can help people early on, and then we can help people uh, for a lifetime after their brain injury. So what we do is, uh, for someone who needed to be hospitalized after a brain injury, we will uh, be consulted and uh, work with the surgeons in regards to looking at what level of consciousness, responsiveness, does someone have? Because that is important in a lot of decision making and a lot of um, care decisions. We'll evaluate what kind of things we can do to prevent future problems. So if we act now, we can do we can work on preserving range of motion of someone's joints so that later when, they're, when they are awake, they can actually walk and use, use their limbs. Um, we help manage, uh, determine seizure management or seizure prophylaxis management. Um, we help with uh, waking people up, so looking at the medications and trying to see if there's medications that are actually hindering someone's recovery. Seeing if there's medications we can start to try to start getting responsiveness um, a lot of people have this really bad tone that we will help uh, choose medications to help treat. And then hopefully, if the patient is needing it, we'll, they'll re come over to inpatient rehabilitation, to a rehabilitation hospital or rehabilitation unit. Where there we get the entire team together um, to work uh, together on the goals of usually the goal of getting them home. Um, We'll work on a range of different things, uh, vestibular, all those different symptoms I mentioned earlier, the therapist and the physician and the rehab nurses, the case managers. We all work together to come up with the treatment plan. Uh, and then we regularly meet with each other to see how we're doing along that course and, again, correct and problem solve it if we're not making those goals. And then after discharge, they'll continue following up with a rehabilitation doctor and on a regular basis, we'll keep moving towards the goals that we need to to get back to a full life. And then they also may be continuing to get outpatient therapy, home health therapies, whatever different therapies they may, may need. Unfortunately, a lot of times over time, the, the follow-up and the intensity of the therapies will drift off, either from unawareness of the importance of that or a lack of resources. So what I'm going to do is I, I've picked several cases that to try to help you know what, how is it that we go about trying to help people. So the first gentleman, um, he had post-concussive syndrome. So what that means is this is a 29-year-old soldier, and he had two combat injuries uh, where both, both incidents, he was in a vehicle when an IED exploded. And both times he had very brief, just seconds, of um, memory loss. After the second one, he immediately started getting headaches, and he's had headaches ever since then. Um, he said that they were very excruciating. He'd have about one or two a week. Um, they happened to be precipitated by light and uh, sudden weather changes. They were associated with uh, blurred vision and nausea. He also had some other symptoms of lightheadedness, irritability, and difficulty sleep. All of these things are very common with traumatic brain injury. He had been labeled as having post-traumatic uh, post stress disorder. And um, he had been tried previously on a medication 
Uh, that's an antidepressant that we commonly use for post-traumatic stress disorder. We also use it sometimes for headaches, and we also use it for sleep. But unfortunately, it actually made things worse for him. He actually said he got very mean on that treatment, and then nothing else was tried. So he came to me four years later, um, and he was just living with the headaches, but he was curious if anything could be done. And I was thinking, so four years living with this, this must be very resistant to treatment, and what am I going to be able to do to help this gentleman? And listening to him, I said, well, actually, your, your headaches sound like they're migraine-like, which is very common after a traumatic brain injury. So the treatment for that is to start you on a regular dose of, of propanolol. Uh, and we're going to have to start this, and we'll titrate up the dose, and I'll see you back next month, and we'll keep working on this for a long time. So I gave that prescription to him, and a couple weeks later, he called and said, I just wanted to tell Dr. Hammond that my headaches are controlled. So that was easy. Uh, he did follow up uh, one month later, and he actually was just taking propanolol 10 milligrams twice a day, and it controlled his headaches. So it was a real shame that he was living for four years like that, but I was thrilled that I could help him because I anticipated it was going to take a long time with a lot of trial and error. So the next case is a 55-year-old gentleman, severe traumatic brain injury, and also had a C7, a high level of spinal cord injury. So he could move with a C7 level, if he could, he would have been able to, to move his arms uh, but it was some, some weakness uh, in, his, in his hands. Um, so he was minimally responsive. He, uh, the only responses he would have is uh, very inconsistently he would, he would grimace, which is a reflex, and he, he would withdraw um, when you were arranging his shoulders. But it did look like that was very specific to some pain stimulus. Um, very severely contracted shoulders, um, he was on numerous medications that were just keeping him unresponsive. So the sedating medications he was on, he was on a seizure medicine, which is just known for being sedating. He was on two very powerful uh, pain narcotic pain medications, which are known for being sedated. Sedating spasticity we try to manage, but in people with brain injury, we usually don't use baclofen because it's very, very sedating. And he was also on clonidine, which in people with brain injury can be very, very sedating. So this gentleman was just being snowed, and here we were actually trying to do rehabilitation on him. So, and then he also, he had never had a seizure, so he didn't really, at this point, didn't need to be on a seizure medication. So we actually, first thing we did was we weaned him off all those medications, and he woke up and he started doing things. Um, and I evaluated why he was having so much pain. And uh, a lot of times with brain injury, you can get bone growth in areas where you, where you don't need it. So around the shoulder, around the elbows for him. Um, and so it was contracting his joints like that. And then we also found that he was having what's called complex regional pain syndrome, a, a disorder that can just make your hands extremely painful. And so every time we were touching him or arranging him, it was just incredibly painful for him. So we treated both of those issues. Well, we treated the complex regional pain syndrome and with steroids, and that went away. And then the only thing we had left is the heterotop calcification, the extra bone growth, and the contractures. And because we'd gotten his pain under better control, we were now able to do the range of motion that was necessary for that. So here's a, a very interesting case. It's a 38-year-old female. She's a ba bank executive. Uh, she fell off her horse, had a very severe brain injury with some bleeding on the head, subdural hematoma. She was aphasic, so she had a really hard time talking. And she kept saying, Bank of America put a rabbit in my ear. And she said this over and over and over. And I kept thinking she was just trying to say something. But with her aphasia, she kept saying rabbit instead of something else. But she worked for Bank of America. So I didn't think too much of it until we really could not control her behavior. Um, she, she was just doing very odd behavior. She was trying to drink her perfume. And all these things added up to when people are doing odd behaviors and they have paranoia, occasionally that's from what's called temporal lobe seizures. So we did an evaluation of the different things that might be going on. We checked her pituitary function and we looked at her medications and we looked at various things that uh, could be other causes. And then I did an EEG with temporal leads and found that sure enough, she's having temporal lobe seizures and that's actually pretty easy to treat. So put her on, for this individual, I put her on carbamazepine, which is, a, is the treatment, one of the treatments for that. She got better and we sent her home. 
So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then years later, we were, you know, we were able to get her off the medication, and she didn't need it anymore. The seizures uh, never recurred. So this is a so fatigue is a really big problem after brain injury, and this is a 56-year-old female. She's in a motor vehicle crash, had loss of consciousness for five minutes. She complained of cognitive difficulties, severe fatigue, especially after she would be um, working really hard trying to use her brain on activities, decreased balance, and some weakness on her right in her right side. And she, she did therapies, her balance improved, her strength improved. Um, we started her on methylphenidate, uh, or also known as Ritalin, and that helped her quite a bit with her cognitive function. And it initially helped with her fatigue, but then it, it quit helping with that. And in doing a lab workup, I found that she had hypothyroidism and also diabetes, and we got that treated, and the fatigue, which was her major problem, got better. So unfortunately, depression and aggression is very common uh, after brain injury. And so this is a gentleman uh, that we see this scenario quite, quite commonly where people come to us just highly aggressive and what we call agitated in the rehab hospital. And it can be difficult to manage because they don't want to be in the rehab hospital and they have no idea why they're there. And the more you can tell them does not help. And so this gentleman, uh, he, he had actually fallen because uh, he was choking and hit his head. He had a subretinoid hemorrhage. He had hit his head so hard that he had a fracture at the back of his skull. Um, his CT scan and, and follow-up over the following days showed worsening edema or swelling. His Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a scale that we use to measure outcome, uh, the, wor the best is 15 and the worst is a 3. So his Glasgow Coma Scale wasn't too bad. It was between 12 to 15. Uh, he had low sodium, which was uh, probably from pituitary dysfunction. And um, he was very agitated. In fact, he left the building twice, which is what we call a code eagle. So the entire hospital goes running after someone, and we usually find him at the building next door, which is a fitness center. So uh, he showed up two months later to my clinic to, to let me know that he was doing great. That was actually the only reason he was there, because he, he said, I'm doing awesome. I feel really embarrassed that I left the hospital twice, because my friends told me that. But I'm doing great. I'm back at work. Everything's awesome. And I remember thinking, that, that is great. I said, please know to call me, though, if things change. So I saw him again recently, because um, several months later, he lost his job, which is also very common after brain injury because uh, people may go back to work, but may not be functioning well, but not, people don't understand why they're not functioning well, and they don't, know to, they don't know that they're not doing well until they lose their job. And then that caused him to get highly depressed. He called his primary care doctor and was started on an antidepressant, uh, Wellbutrin, and they chose that because he had previously been on a different medication that was causing uh, uh, side effects that he didn't want. So, um, so he, he's talking to me, and he said that I used to be a teddy bear, and now I'm just a bear. He's just very aggressive and angry and irritable and still depressed. And so we actually switched him back to uh, one of the class of medications that he had been successful on before for his depression, but a different agent than he had had the side effects with. And I started him on methylphenidate to see if that would help him with his aggression. And he came back to clinic, and he's just extremely happy and describes himself as a teddy bear now. So we still have some more work to do. And he also, uh, luckily, uh, got a new job. So that, I don't think that's because of the methylphenidate, but I won't argue with it. So, um, so this is a fascinating case that has kept me in this uh, career. So this is a 31-year-old who had an arterial venous malformation bleed, so bleed, severe bleeding in the head which resulted in what we call locked-in syndrome. Locked-in syndrome means you cannot do anything motor-wise. Motor you cannot move your arms. You cannot move your legs. You cannot talk. The only thing you can do is you can look up and down. So that's all she could do when I met her. So and I thought, I, you know, I hope I can help her. I can help her family. We're going to do what we can. But I don't, this was early in my career. I have no idea what, what outcome we're going to get here. So um, I should have the outcome covered because you're probably already reading. 
So this lady, she came to inpatient rehab. We did home health therapy. We did outpatient therapy. When insurance said no more therapy, her husband bought parallel bars to put into their house so they could do therapies in the house. They continued to get more and more therapy. She would come to me about once a year and said, I need more therapy. And I would order therapy. And oftentimes the therapist would say, I don't know what Dr. Hammond is doing. You know you're not going to recover. You need to quit. And she, said, and she would call me and say, they need to quit. So we just kept doing this year after year, and she just kept making progress. And the reason I kept ordering the therapy is every time we did, she'd make progress. So the last time I saw her was 10, was 10 years after her bleed, and I released her to drive. That's how well she was doing. She was walking, with a, I think, with a cane uh, and a brace, but she was amazing. And I returned her back to driving. And then I actually left that hospital to take a different job, I actually gave, told the story at my welcome reception. And the next day, I actually had a letter from her because she had found out I had moved, and she had written me a letter. Um, just that's not the outcome that I thought you would get from locked-in syndrome. And certainly not everyone does, but some people do. And an important message is we need to expect that this is possible because if she and her husband hadn't told me it was possible, I, I don't know, I may not have gone there. So, and this is actually during my residency, uh, I was doing, uh, learning how to do what's called electromyography. So I was doing something different than brain injury, but I was reading about it because I was going to give a talk about brain injury. And this 52-year-old lady came in so that I could do this electrodiagnostic study on her. So I was asking her why, why she was here, and she was having some pain down her arm, but really she was having uh, headaches. Um, uh, let's see, headaches, difficulty thinking, fatigue. Um, and all of this started when she was at work and her chair tilted back and she hit her head. And I said, oh, okay. And so we had to do the electrodiagnostic study to find out what, if she had any nerve damage. But I thought, well, this lady has had a, a brain injury. This is just what I've been reading about. She has what's called post-concussive syndrome and she needs to see a rehabilitation doctor. So I referred her to one of my uh, attendings at the time. So, and unfortunately, that's really common. <laughs> so, these are my colleagues with Mythbusters. <laughs> so, in brain injury, there's a lot of misinformation. So, and it complicates trying to help people get better when providers, as well as people in the community, have these same things repeated over and over again. So, I'm going to go through some of the common myths. And then we'll talk through each one of why they're not true. So a concussion is not a brain injury. And hopefully we've had enough media attention now that people know that a concussion is a brain injury. But I can tell you, I've given talks before in front of medical audience that later someone will say, you mean a concussion is a brain injury? So here's a myth, concussion is not a brain injury. If there's no loss of consciousness or if the CT scan of the head is normal, then you also did not have a brain injury. A concussion, that's temporary. Mild TBI has mild consequences. <coughs> TBI improves after getting hit on the head again. People with brain injury forget their past. And more myths, uh, coma may, may last for years for some people. And vegetative is the same thing as saying vegetable. And I hear that in the hospitals and otherwise. So it's a myth, and I'll tell you why. Level of consciousness or awareness is easy to determine, and the diagnosis of level of consciousness is always accurate. If the chart says it, then it's true. If the chart says they're in vegetative state, then they're in vegetative state. Severe TBI always has a poor outcome. Prognosis in traumatic brain injury is very clear from the, from the onset. We can tell you in the first few days what your prognosis is going to be. And then if you're in vegetative state by one month, then we know that you're going to be in vegetative state in the future. And all recovery that you're going to get after a brain injury happens in the first year. So those are all not true. So now I've got to un unteach you. Uh, a concussion is a brain injury. So concussion is just another term for mild traumatic brain injury. 
And mild traumatic brain injury actually has a long list of terms. I don't know why we don't want to call it mild brain injury. I'll even sit in meetings where we'll determine we are not going to call this mild traumatic brain injury. We're going to do a conf I mean, we're not going to call this concussion. Uh, we're going to do a conference on this, and we're going to call it mild TBI. And then the materials will come out, and you've got all these terms used. So concussion is just a mild brain injury. Um, it is a brain injury. So, and I think some of that is because people think that because you don't, nothing showed up on the CT scan, so it couldn't be a brain injury. So, in fact, the, di the definition of mild traumatic brain injury is that you simply, you've had a force to the head, and then you've had some altered loss of consciousness. And that could be b just being dazed and confused. It could last for seconds, or it can last longer. If it lasts more than 30, um, if the being dazed and confused lasts more than uh, 24 hours, then that's considered either moderate or severe brain injury. And if loss of consciousness lasts more than 30 uh, minutes, then it's considered either moderate or severe. So, but you don't have to have loss of consciousness. It's just that days are confused, that altered consciousness to be able to have suffered a brain injury. And the same thing, CT scan imaging, the reason we do it after someone's had an injury is simply to look for life-threatening bleeds. We don't do it to try to diagnose a brain injury. So, so what are the consequences? Why do we worry about mild traumatic brain injury? Because I told you that most people get better. So, and that is true, and thank goodness. Although what we worry about immediately is there are a few people that look like they've had mild traumatic brain injury that have a life-threatening uh, hemorrhage. So it could be that they, they've hurt an artery that then a few hours later is going to cause a bleed that, that could kill them. So we worry about those kind of uh, the intracranial hemorrhages that could be life-threatening. And then we also worry about second impact syndrome. So second impact syndrome is where you've had a brain injury, but you haven't quite recovered and you have a second brain injury. So you've had a brain injury, let's say, at football practice this week. You didn't really think about it. You didn't tell anyone. You're in a game this Friday. You get hit again. And the brain already has some swelling there. And all of a sudden, you've got this ex excess swelling that the brain can't accommodate. And we can't treat it. It's very resistant to treatment. And so uh, about 50% of those cases will go on to die. So this is, you know, these are these horrible cases that you hear about from state to state and, and why a lot of laws exist now about reporting brain injuries and being careful to clear people back to return to play. So those are the life-threatening things. And then in the few weeks post-injury, people might be having some effects of the brain injury. And we like to do a lot of education to help people know that that's just a normal response to the brain injury. Um, and then we wor what we really worry about are the longer-term effects uh, that people may end up going on to live with. So post-concussive syndrome, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And we've already talk seen a case of that. But that's where you get symptoms. That we All the symptoms we talked about, you might get a smattering of those symptoms and they may last for any duration of time. And then people, after one injury, are vulnerable to another injury. And that might be because of the same risk-taking behavior that got them the first injury, or it might be because their awareness is decreased, their cognitive performance is decreased, they have decreased balance, and all those things may go into play in getting them injured again. So we worry about re-injury and what the consequences of that second and third uh, injury will be. And then what we found is the effects of injury after injury after injury aren't just like adding an injury. It's, cum it's like multiplying injuries. It can have devastating effects. And then as many people have heard on the news and stuff like that, we worry about uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, or CTE. And that's seen very commonly. Uh, uh, it's been found to have occurred in, uh, in professional athletes, and we think it's happening from what's called subconcussive blows. You don't even know you're getting all those concussions. Uh, and over time, a thought to lead to, to CTE. So post-concussive syndrome. So that's just a fancy term for any constellation of symptoms from the physical symptoms you might experience, the cognitive symptoms, and the affective symptoms. So, there was actually a study when I was in med school that actually 
queried medical students uh, whether or not you got better after a second brain injury. And at the time, the doctors, the medical students thought yes. So just thought I should cover that one. You don't get better with a second injury. I think my generation in, that was in med school had watched too much of Gilligan's Island. So people don't forget their past. They may have patches of their past that they don't remember. But usually it's like the moments before the injury they may not remember. In se severe cases, they may not remember that day. But usually they remember their past. They have a great long-term memory. And so that, that's called retrograde amnesia, and it's really short. And then they're going to have a period when they're unconscious, perhaps, as well as past that, where they're they're still confused. They're day -to, they don't have day-to-day -day memory. And they're never, the things that they don't remember during that time, that time they're confused, they're never gonna remember those things. And that's fine. So that's usually seconds to minutes to days. Uh, with our severe injuries, it may be two to three months of post-traumatic amnesia. Uh, but it doesn't go on f forever. And then it, the difficulties they have with memory isn't what's called post-traumatic amnesia. They may just have short-term memory, which is extremely common after injury. So I've been talking mostly about mild traumatic brain injury, and I'm going to switch gears and talk more about the, the moderate and severe brain injuries. So first, I, I want to tell you a little bit about consciousness, because I think it's really important uh, to understanding some of these myths. So normally, and I think everyone in the room uh, is awake, and aware. So those are the two things that go into um, defining consciousness, is that you're awake and aware. And in coma, you're not awake. So the eyes are actually closed. So you're not awake, and you're not aware. And coma lasts about two weeks, two to four weeks. And then you're going to emerge from that to be higher functioning, or you may emerge into what's called vegetative state. And vegetative state is when you get eye opening. So you're no longer in coma. There's eye opening. So you're awake. There's arousal. But there's no awareness, no interaction with the environment. In minimally conscious state, which is very different than vegetative state, you're awake. And you have intermittent awareness. So there are times, if you really catch the right moment and have a nice examination with the person, that you can get them to follow a command. And you can understand that they actually are interacting with the environment, but something is keeping them from fully participating. And there, the reason that's so important is there's a greater likelihood that people who are in minimally conscious state are going to go on to, to, do, to have much more function than if they were in vegetative state. And then locked-in syndrome, which I talked to you about, there's arousal and there's awareness. But if you don't know it, you could think that they're not aware, uh, because you actually have to be asking questions that facilitate yes, no with the eyes up and down. So read this in the paper frequently, uh, things like man wakes up after 18 years in coma. And it is a fantastic story, but that he actually wasn't in coma. He was probably in minimally conscious state, but could have been in vegetative state. It's actually a fascinating story. But again, coma lasts two to four weeks, and the differentiating factor is that the eye is open. So vegetable. I hear this frequently, that people were either told, well, he's going to be a veg vegetable. I've even heard it in the healthcare scenario. And the, where this term comes from is not from vegetables. It's because it means that there's a return of what we call the vegetative functions or autonomic functions. And it's just a poor choice of terms um, because it sounds very similar to vegetable. So in vegetative state, you actually have the sleep-wake cycles. You can have grimacing and yawning and a lot of involuntary uh, reflexes, involuntary response to pain. So level of consciousness is easy to determine, and it's always right in the chart. So, Unfortunately, um, to really get the diagnosis right, you need to do several examinations, because they might be having an off day, or they might have just gotten a medication that knocked them out. And we've done, there have been now four studies that have looked through charts to see how accurate the diagnosis is in the chart. Uh, 
So for example, does it say vegetative state when they're in minimally conscious state? And 37 to 40% of the time, the diagnosis of minimally conscious state versus vegetative state was not correct. And that just is to show you that it's a very difficult diagnosis to make, especially if you don't do a very systematic examination. And it's not something that people are overly trained on, uh, and it's a, a, a pretty extensive examination that is done. So this, um, so vegetative state, if you're in vegetative state at one month, um, you should certainly be able to say that's, that's where you're going to be, right? It's already been a month. So, um, so that's not the case. What we found is after a traumatic brain injury that we really can't say with any reasonable uh, certainty for the first 12 months that if you're in vegetative state, we really don't know your outcome. And what this um, shows... So this is for adults, and this is for children. This is for traumatic injuries, and this is for non-traumatic injuries. And what you see, this is people who are in vegetative state at one month, and then people who had regained consciousness. So most of these people, by three months, but more by six months, and by 12 months. Now, I don't really know. We made conclusions, or they made conclusions for this article, that after 12 months, we can call that permanence. But quite honestly, after 12 months, there weren't that many more people left to kind of follow their outcomes. So, um, but we would, with certainty, that you shouldn't be making such a, a proclamation at, uh, before 12 months. With anoxic brain injury, uh, we think that that's more at the three month, and you can see this. So this is for non-traumatic injury, like an anoxic injury, and you can see that it kind of levels off the time period for emerging. So I did a study where um, I was curious about how accurate we are as physicians and guessing at the outcome. Um, so because as at around the 48-hour mark, there's a lot of need to know or we think we need to know what the outcome is going to be so we can provide that information to family members. So I was curious, well, how accurate are we, right? Because it doesn't do much to give inaccurate information where we make uh, poor choices. So. We actually uh, enrolled four people who had joined. We and we did very thorough evaluations, and then at six months, all this information to thirty physicians of different specialties to ask them, what do you think this person's outcome is going to be? So here's their story, here's their exam, CT. And what do you think their six-month outcome will be? What we found is that more often than not, we were wrong. Um, so it's a pretty good message, right? So um, the six-month outcomes were much better than what people predicted were going to be. And to be right, because of that, to be right, uh, you actually had to have a poor outcome to get it right. So, um, so the outcomes were very good for these four people, uh, but we just didn't get that call correctly. So this is not to remind you about hurricane season. <laughs> but, but this is to show you that really, when we're talking about brain injury outcomes, we should be thinking about it like we would with a hurricane. Early, you know, out in the ocean, I am not going to try to predict everything and say, everybody evacuate. We're going to watch it, and we're going to be there for you, and we're going to make plans, and we're going to do everything we can to, to get the best outcome. But along the course, I'm going to keep doing examinations. I'm going to keep making decisions, and I'm not going to try to proclaim something I don't know. So, so do severe brain injuries have poor outcomes, because it's got this term severe. Um, and so why we call something mild, moderate, and severe is simply what it looked like in the first 24 hours. Did they lose consciousness, and for how long? Did they have confusion, and for how long? And that's what buys you the mild, moderate, and severe. So, um, and then also, so many times, my patients have come in close to their one-year anniversary, and they're scared to death because they've heard somewhere that all the recovery you're going to get, you get in that first year. So this is a study that we did using the a national database with 
um, over, over 15,000 people in this database who have had moderate or severe traumatic brain injury. And we got the individuals who, at the time of rehab admission, they weren't following commands. So these were the ones who really don't know what their outcome is going to be. I wonder if they'll ever start following commands. So there were 110 individuals among the 15,000 that, that fit these criteria. And then uh, what I show here is each year of follow-up. So year, the blue is year one, the orange <laughs> is year two, the gray is year five, and the yellow is year 10. And, what we, and then these are activities of daily living. So eating, grooming, bathing, dressing of the upper body and lower body, toileting, bladder and bowel management, uh, bed to chair transfers, toilet transfers, um, whether or not they could walk or not or, use, or propel their wheelchair, um, comprehension, expression, social interaction, problem solving, and memory. And what we found is by the first year post-injury, incredible independence, right? So this is the proportion of people who are independent at, at that activity. So at least 50% or more were independent at one year. So okay, if that were all you got, but what we found is in the years post-injury, there's a, li a, a little to a lot more recovery that was happening uh, in these different realms. So there are more people that could be gaining independence after that one year uh, data, in fact, and tells a different story than what people have been telling. So here's a different way of looking at the data. This is using an eight-point scale called the the extended Glasgow outcome scale. And what we did is we looked, um, so this is comparing year one and year two, comparing year two and year five, year five and year two, um, 10 and year 15. People get better or worse on that item, eight item scale uh, from that one interval to the next. And what we found is that in the pink, are the people who declined either one and uh, what we found in the green is the people who improved by one or two items. So what we found <laughs> was that um, more often than not, people change from year to year. So we shouldn't be thinking that people don't change. So the blue is the people who didn't change. So it's really important to know that almost all of these studies that, that we've done have used what's called the Glasgow Outcome Scale. It used to be a five-point scale. And to make it worse is we usually dichotomize that to make it just two different outcomes, either poor or favorable. So I'm going to tell you what these outcomes are, because that's when, you're, when someone's interpreting the literature out there, we're thinking about these as the outcomes, OK? So, in the Glasgow Outcome Scale, you have dead, vegetative state, severe disability, moderate disability, and good recovery. And in severe disability, you've got people who are in minimally conscious state that we talked about, who are intermittently following commands. But we've also got people who they can't figure out like the change for shopping. They can't uh, arrange for travel on their own. Um, and I, you know, I could get by without shopping um, and probably make a lot of people happy. So um, I don't know. I'd hate for someone to judge my outcome being on whether or not I could shop or not. So it really, I mean, it shows that people are having some cognitive difficulty, but it doesn't mean, I don't think it means what people think of when you say severe disability. And I don't think it means poor outcome when you're comparing it to being dead in vegetative state. So basically, we're lumping dead vegetative state and not shopping, and not being able to arrange transportation, all in the same thing. And then moderate disability and good recovery, where you're able to do pretty much everything except for maybe uh, not being able to do some of your social and leisure activities and or maybe not going back to work yet. So that's important. I'm going to actually give you some cases now to predict their outcome, and, and we'll use that five-point scale. So now in doing this, I also gave the, a similar talk in front of um, a multidisciplinary audience of physicians, so uh, neurosurgeons, trauma surgeons, physical medicine rehab doc, palliative care, 
and uh, we used audience response. So I actually collected all their answers. And so not only am I going to ask you to think about their outcome, but I'm going to show you what we as physicians came up with when I gave that talk. So the first case is a 20-year-old who was driving with his brother when they were in a motor vehicle crash. And his brother was killed in the accident. He was taken uh, to the emergency room where he was posturing, which is not a good sign. And his Glasgow Coma Scale was four. So as I told you, three and four are at the bottom of, of the scale. His CT scan showed deep injury, it was called dis diffuse axonal injury, and punctate lesions. So those also are not good signs. Bilateral ventricular hemorrhage. So a lot of, a lot of injury there that was, that was visible on the CT scan. And unfortunately, he also, during his hospital course, developed meningitis. So he in, in, developed an infection that did not, you know, that probably impacted his outcome. And I met him at, a, at one and a half months uh, after injury. He came to our rehabilitation hospital. And uh, he was, we thought he might be having what's called storming, where you have sweating and your temperature's up. All those other vital signs uh, did not, were not consistent with that. But he would have these reactions also to noxious stimuli where he would posture and his temperature would go up. So it was probably what we call storming. Um, and he did not have any responsiveness to command. So he would be what's, what's at the time, one and a half months, uh, he was in what's called vegetative state. So if you think about it for a little bit, um, I, what I'm going to have asked the, the surgery group and the PMNR people is what is their outcome? And we've got dead vegetative state, severe disability, moderate disability, and good recovery. So what that audience said at that time was that his outcome at one year would be likely severe disability, maybe moderate disability, or good recovery. And unfortunately, uh, his outcome uh, was that he was still in vegetative state at one year and 10 years. And, um, you know, amazingly, he's got this incredible family uh, that are so, they already lost one son, and they're actually just glad to have him around. They, you know, they wish anything that he would be responsive, and they take him uh, with, him every, with them everywhere, an uh, incredibly loving family, and they've trained their daughters to be able to take care of them when they're not here. So a 52-year-old who was in a motor vehicle crash, he was unrestrained, he went through the windshield. His Glasgow coma scale was three, so the lowest, uh, when he was in the emergency department. He had normal uh, reflexes that we checked to see if it's, you know, if, if the brainstem reflexes are intact, and they were. His CT scan showed bleeding what we call subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they also had multiple contusions, the bruising on the brain. Uh, he also had a bunch of other injuries. Um, so he had an injury of the diaphragm and his spleen and multiple uh, rib fractures and um, what we call pneumothorax and uh, was on the ventilator for a long time. So lots of pulmonary issues and some fractures. And his past medical history is very significant for severe alcohol use and getting into fights quite frequently. I, when I wanted to pull his medical record, I called medical records and said, can you pull his chart? And I went there, and there were five different charts from that year, but they weren't the chart I was looking for because that's how many times he had been in the ER or hospitalized from getting into fights because of the alcohol. Uh, he had also had, so he'd had several brain injuries, and he'd also had a transient ischemic attack. So complicated prior history. Um, what do you think his outcome is going to be? So this gentleman had a good recovery, and the audience that day did not necessarily predict that. Uh, this is a gentleman that we call for our research studies every year, and this guy says, tell Dr. Hammond I'm alive. I'm so happy to be alive. Um, he, and so within a year, he was already back to work. He had quit drinking. He uh, got back together with his ex-wife, so he's repaired damage to relationships in his family, uh, connected back with his daughter, just so thrilled to be alive. Uh, he was having some difficulty with his attention and some anxiety, and we treated that with uh, a touch of medications, and he responded very well. So good outcome for him. It's a very sad case of a 17-year-old gentleman who their friends were acting out um, 
a scenario that I think they did not think was going to end up with anyone getting hurt. They were videotaping the entire thing to post somewhere. So basically, um, he was in a, in a shopping cart, and they were rolling him down a hill, and one of his friends decided to get a baseball bat to hit him in the chest with. And when, they, when he did, he went into sudden cardiac arrest. And then his friends were very scared and left. So this gentleman showed up. He was resuscitated for more than 25 minutes. You know, he got to the ER, uh, his Glasgow coma scale on the lowest end. He was intubated, which is what the three, the T means. His, his MRI imaging was consistent with what we see when someone's had hypoxic, anoxic Im injury. And I was consulted at one week to say, can you tell us what his outcome's gonna be? And this was really tough because I thought, well, I, I think I know what, like, what everyone thinks the outcome is gonna be and do I go along with that or do I follow those guidelines that I showed you earlier, which would mean for anoxic brain injury, we really ought to wait three months. And I sat there for a long time with my pen in hand trying to figure out what I should do and I finally decided we should go with the guidelines. Uh, this is not gonna be popular, but we're gonna go with the guidelines. And we're, we really don't know the outcome for three months. Um, so, what do you think his six month outcome is going to be? So, so, this is a gentleman that, so yeah, so that's why I said you're going to have to wait at least three months for this guy for us to know his true outcome. That's what I wrote in the chart. Uh, at one month, uh, we had a lot of meetings about this gentleman. Uh, he I had his eyes open, so he's out of coma. He's very restless, agitated. He was pulling at tubes and thrashing violently when he was approached. Um, so some thought that I had that it, there might be some purposefulness there, um, but we weren't really able to, to get that to, to be clearly demonstrated. And, so, and his family wasn't able to take care of him because they worked during the day. So he went to a nursing home, and my PM and our colleagues followed him there. And pretty quickly, we thought, you know what, I think it's time for him to come to rehab. So at three months after his injury, he was admitted to our rehab service. And it was very exciting seeing him that day. He was following commands uh, intermittently. So um, sometimes I would ask him to follow commands, and he wouldn't, and sometimes he would. Um, and he had a lot of movement. You could tell he was going to have some movement disorder from the anoxic injury, so some abnormal motor movements. In four months, he was consistently following commands. And uh, we, um, he couldn't speak uh, because of his aphasia, but he could gesture correctly uh, with hand gestures. And then at five months, by five months, which is around the time we discharged him, he was talking appropriately, uh, sometimes needed some prompting to, to get started with talking. He was eating, we took out his feeding tube because he didn't need it anymore. He was walking with some assistance and he was discharged from a nursing home because, because of the family working. And I would say his projected six-month outcome was severe disability because I never got to see him again. He went to the nursing home and I never saw him. And my last day working at the last, at, at my previous employer, employers, um, I was telling my brain injury team goodbye and I was walking out the door when someone else walked in and the person said, hi, Dr. Hammond. And I, I didn't know who it was, so I, I was about to leave, and then I thought, well, I gotta know who that was, and it was him. But I forgot to ask if he could shop or arrange for transportation, so <laughs> I, I don't know how good his outcome was. So the next case is a 19-year-old motor vehicle crash, glossic coma scale of three. Again, the posturing, um, a lot of hemorrhage on, on the CT scan and this sheer injury or diffuse axonal injury was seen. He also had dislocated his hip and he had real severe spasticity, which happens after brain injury uh, due to the, the disinhibition of the muscle tone. So for him, because, because I don't know his outcome after two months, what do you think his two month outcome is? Two. <laughs> so, um, so this is someone whose outcome is severe disability. So at one month, uh, he was admitted to rehab. Uh, he was awake and alert, and he had waxing and waning responses to pain. So sometimes he would, sometimes he weren't, wouldn't. He, was, he wasn't uh, communicating um, verbally or making any sounds, uh, and no response to command. 
So it was just this response to pain stimuli every once in a while. And at two months, um, he actually was talking appropriately, eating, and we just needed to give him assistance for transfers. So um, that would rank as severe disability. And I wish I knew how he did after that, but he never followed back up. So the next case, this is a gentleman, 46 year old. He had HIV and hepatitis and IV drug use. And uh, he had actually ruined a lot of family ties. Um, and he was found down in his yard. The thought was that he had been assaulted. Uh, Glasgow Coma Scale on the way uh, to the hospital was seven. So what's called severe brain injury, uh, but a little bit higher than what we'd been talking about, the two, threes and fours. Um, he would arouse to pain only, nothing else. Um, so he had um, sluggish pupillary reactions. Um, and CT scan showed a very large, uh, what we call subdural hematoma. So a large uh, hematoma that was causing pressure and, and shifting the brain and causing pressure down on the brain against the skull, uh, which is called herniation. So it's a really bad sign. Uh, during his acute care hospital stay, he was arousable only if you push really hard on the chest, he would arouse. Uh, his girlfriend said that there was one time that she had seen a response from him. So what do you think the outcome is for him? If you keep guessing good, you might get it right. So that was the lesson earlier. So I tried to give you the answers to the test. So this gentleman, the plan during the first month was to withdraw care. And the ethics committee said, you can't do that until you consult rehab. So again, we kind of thought through the guidelines and said, yep, I don't think you should withdraw care. So at one and a half months post injury, he actually came to our inpatient rehab unit. And I remember thinking, okay, okay, maybe this is the one that's not gonna, not gonna recover. But at two and a half months, he just suddenly woke up like in the movies and started talking. And he's like, I don't know what drugs you have, have me on, but I'm really high. <laughs> Get me off of this. And it was Riddle and I just started to try to wake him up. So uh, amazing. And he got reconnected with his family. And, um, and uh, when I discharged him at three months, he was in what we call severe disability. Uh, but by the time of, of one year, he was a good recovery and reconnected with his family. So and this is a 21-year-old, this is our last case, a 21-year-old, um, the second to last case, 21-year-old male who was unrestrained and, and hit um, T-bone, car accident, unresponsive, Glasgow Coma Scale uh, wasn't found in the chart, um, the CT, a lot of bleeding on the CT scan um, with contusions and, and uh, evidence of, of bleeding. Um, and his Glasgow coma scale was in, throughout the stay was anywhere from five to 11 um, and inconsistent command following was noted. So um, at one and a half months, um, his reflexes, brainstem reflexes were intact. There was no response to command, no uh, verbal responses, no motor responses. The responses that happened in the acute care, I couldn't ever uh, observe or elicit. And this is a gentleman who uh, remained as long as I knew him in vegetative state. Yeah. So, and this is the last case. This is a 30 year old female who was in a motor vehicle crash. She was unresponsive at the scene. They had difficulty intubating her with a, a breathing tube. Uh, they couldn't get lines in her. She went into cardiac arrest. They started CPR. They continued CPR in the emergency department for at least 30 minutes. Uh, they finally got an airway obtained. They did an ultrasound just to, you know, to see if the heart was moving and there was no uh, cardiac wall motion. And they said, this is it. We, we can't do anything else to save her. And so the code was called and later they noticed that she had a pulse. <laughs> so uh, she, came, she had come around and they, so they did a CT scan. It did show a significant subdural hematoma with a lot of mass effect. And the decision was, you know, her prognosis because of the, the brain injuries as well as the, the anoxia, it just is gonna be too much. Um, so they decided not to operate. So she has at least 
uh, severe disability to good recovery because I didn't see her after one year. But at one to three weeks, because um, there was this big discussion about the poor outcome, but then the discussion didn't get updated because the family wanted to withdraw care, but the surgeons thought, well, no, because they were seeing things that the, and they wanted to, to wait and they thought our outcome might be okay. So there's a disconnect with family and surgeons being able to talk because the family wanted to withdraw care and said, well, you know, legal issues and stuff. So this is someone that actually we, several weeks later, three weeks later, we actually had a family conference. And before the family conference, I went in to see her. I was covering consults and I asked her to do a bunch of questions and she followed all of the commands. Uh, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is not someone in vegetative state. So we went to the family conference and told them that she, you know, that she was following all these commands. And so at least her outcome is going to be that she's going to be able to follow commands. And here's the possibilities. And her father was so excited and wanted to, wanted to pursue rehabilitation. And at one year, uh, she had significant difficulty with her memory, but she was walking and talking and, and doing great other than the memory difficulties. And she wasn't yet uh, working. And, and I, she never followed back up. So I don't, I don't know her long-term outcome. So hopefully we've busted some myths. And now you know that concussion is a brain injury, that you don't need to have uh, loss of consciousness or anything on your CT scan in order to have had a brain injury. And mild brain injury, it could have no consequences or it could have significant consequences. Um, the consequences of brain injury are silent uh, and a lot, there are a lot of difficulties that people may suffer after brain injury. Um, the coma is actually a short-term thing and uh, oftentimes people emerge way past coma to be highly functioning. And that oftentimes we don't get that diagnosis of level of consciousness correct in the hospital. So we actually really need to do systematic examinations and map it along that hurricane course. And just because something is labeled as a severe traumatic brain injury doesn't mean that the outcomes are poor. And we should anticipate that the outcomes are not gonna be poor because from the data I've shown you, in large part, the outcomes are good. So we should start expecting good outcomes because I wonder what outcomes we could have gotten over the, all these years if we were pursuing good outcomes. So we should, in my mind, quit consider things miracles and consider them expected. So thank you. <laughs> and we'll take a few questions if we have. Dr. Hammond, thank you so much for being here. Um, you talked a lot about, with a lot of TBIs, people having aggression, fatigue, anger, um, after you know a TBI. Has, have you ever encountered or heard one of your colleagues encounter a situation where a TBI resulted in maybe a personality disorder like schizophrenia, dissociative disorder, or anything like that? Yeah, no. Um, so usually, does, so there can be all sorts of different um, there's different syndromes where people confuse, you know, they confuse their wife and they have two, you know, they have two different wives that are the same wife and they have a lot of things like that, but I've, I have not seen someone develop schizophrenia from it. Now there is an article um, that, a very nice article that delineates the uh, psychiatric outcomes of brain injury and schizophrenia is listed on there. I just, in my clinical experience, it's usually not from the brain injury, but that article actually does list it as one of the complications. Any other questions? Oh. Based on the limited uh, sampling you showed, uh, it seemed like age didn't really have much of a, uh, a, a correlation. But in general, if you had, say, teenagers and someone elderly in maybe their 80s with the same type injury, would age be a factor? Yeah, so many of the studies have shown a difference in age, uh, that the, wor the older age has a worse outcome. And in large part, we think that might be because you have less brain tissue reserve, right? So you've lost brain tissue as we, as we age. And so you may have less ability to accommodate an injury. Although there certainly are older people who have good outcomes, but the studies show a relationship with older age and poorer outcomes. And one last question. I'll be kind. <laughs> um, the, um, 
You, you mentioned that we hear a lot about concussions, CTE, and I was just wondering, we, we hear on TV they always say they're going to undergo a concussion protocol before they will release them either to play or to be sent for further evaluation. First of all, what is the protocol? And second, how reliable do you think that protocol is in making the determination on the field? So, so the, the biggest message of that protocol is, um, so we, we were assessing people's um, cognitive function and physical function, and uh, the biggest message is if you, they are still symptomatic or have observable, observable findings, that you should not go back to play. So they're, they're, there's, the protocol is a little more complicated than that, but if someone is still having, let's say they're having headaches, they should not go back to play. So, um, or cognitive effects, et cetera. And then the difficulty is making sure that the, the athlete is reporting to you honestly what their symptoms are.